to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James chapter 1, verse number 22. We welcome you today to our study of the wonderful book of James. We're so glad that you've joined us in our broadcast today, and we hope that you'll have your Bible ready as we're going to study the Word of God together in the book of James. Today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to visit their assembly. Whether it be on Sunday or Wednesday, you would be an honored guest at any of their worship services or their Bible studies. In fact, if you'd like to learn more about the Lord's Church or the plan of salvation or, or worship or any of the things that Christians do, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you anytime. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your spiritual journey as well. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, you can access all our videos and audio lessons. We have written material, transcripts of all our lessons, and it's all available 24-7, and it's free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of our study on the book of James, we make that available to you free of charge. You can get a digital download from our website, or if you need a DVD or a CD, We'd mail that to you free of charge as well. You can fill out a media request form from our website or you can uh, write to us or call us at the information given as well. We also want to encourage you in this fast-moving world that we live in to download our streaming app, our app for both the Android and the Apple phone. Those are available from the respective stores and that would be a great tool to help you in your study of the Word of God as well. As we think today about the book of James, we want to introduce some of the ideas in the book of James and highlight some of the practical lessons from James chapter 1 today. What's the book of James all about? James is all about putting God and Christianity above everything else. The key idea in the book of James is to be doers of the Word. As James says in James 1 verse 22, be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It isn't enough to open the Bible and to read it and to believe it and to say it's true. Paul said the things which you heard and received and saw in me, these do. There's the idea, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 9. Paul would say, or James would say in James 1, 27, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And so when we think about the book of James, we're talking about an act of faith, faith in action that has its work boots on and that is out doing what God wants it to do. And so the key ideas are both faith and works, and they go hand in hand in this wonderful book. You know, when we think about the book of James, we need to realize that James is going to teach us in chapter 1 especially about pure religion. What is Christ If you take Christianity and we boil it down to its purest essence, what's it all about for a Christian? What is pure religion? Well, let's think for a few moments today from the book of James about the ideas that James is going to relate to us that are so wonderful and practical as it relates to my life and yours. You know, some have likened the book of James to the Proverbs of the Old Testament. Practical wisdom for everyday living. James is one of the favorite books of so many people. You know, someone has rightly said that you could read the book of James in about 16 minutes but its lessons will last a lifetime. Friend, that's so true. We need powerful lessons 
for everyday living like we find in the book of James. And so when we think about pure religion, what's it all about? Pure religion, first of all, is purified by trials. I want you to look in James chapter 1. You know, something that is purified, that all the defects, all the things that aren't supposed to be in there are removed. Something that's purified has a great strength and it's melted and its core is so strong. Well, friend, the idea of Christians having that strength, they're purified by trials. Look in James chapter 1. And I want you to notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 2. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Did you hear those powerful words that James began with? My brethren, James is writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. And the idea here is, these are people who've come out of Judaism, out of the Old Testament religion of God, and rightfully so, they've transitioned into the religion of Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. But some of them are now suffering for their faith. Their homeland, it's not what it used to be. The, the, the towns in which they live, because they've left Judaism, they're being looked down on, maybe even being ostracized by their own family. Maybe the Pharisees or the, the scribes or the zealots, they might even be persecuting these people and their families. And so James says, my brethren, hear the tenderness, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing the testing of your faith produces patience. And patience, you've got to let it have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's the challenges, the difficulties, the, the trials that we face. The pruning of the branch makes for a better tree often. And friend, that's so true when it relates to Christianity. You know, part of what we as Christians have got to realize is we are going to face persecution or suffering. It's not a might. And it's not a maybe, it's a definite. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, Paul said, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, listen to this, will suffer persecution. Acts 14 verse 22, after Paul had rocks bounced off his head, he was left outside of Lystra and Derby and Iconium, he, he stood up and he said, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. All of us, from time to time, we're going to face problems. We're going to face difficulties. Be sure the devil is working overtime to work on my life and my heart and yours. The world is trying to squeeze us into its mold. Sin is lying at the door. It's desirous for us. Genesis 4 verse 7. And with all of that, from time to time, there are going to be trials. Now, Friend, if I know there are going to be trials, here's what I also have got to know. If I let them, those trials can help me be a better Christian. You know, when I face suffering, when we face loss, when we deal with things that sometimes hurt, how do those things help us? Well, they make our faith stronger because we're more dependent upon God. But just as much as anything, when I face those trials and those persecutions and the difficulties, friend, it, it helps me to realize this world is not temporary, the thing, or this world is temporary, the things of this world are temporary, and it causes me to want to look to heaven. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. It causes me to look away from the temporary things that we face in this world and to realize one day, all this will pass, and I can live with God forever. And so it challenges us to the core, makes us stronger, and makes us look to heaven itself. But then when we think about pure religion, let's also realize that a part of pure religion is that it causes us to really praise God, who is the good giver. 
I want you to look in your Bible in James chapter 1, verse number 17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. What's an aspect of someone who's got pure religion? Well, friend, they realize where it comes from. And they're so grateful for all that God has done for them. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 16 through 18. Colossians 3, verse 17 says that we're to do all things by the authority in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Just stop and think about all the blessings we have. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, verse 3, every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. Friend, when I think about all God's done for me, every, if I'm a Christian, every sin has been washed away. I'll be merciful their sins, their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. Hebrews 8, verse 12, I have uh, the privilege to look up to heaven and call God my Father. This world truly is not my home. But, but, but above all that, God's taking care of me and you physically. If we seek first the kingdom of God, God says, all these things will be added unto you. Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 19, My God shall supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. And it was David in the long ago who said, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Friend, on top of the fact that God has blessed us so richly spiritually, when I think about every blessing I have, where does all that come from? Friend, it all comes down. Listen to these beautiful words again. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above. And friend, that causes me to stop and thank God and to praise Him. You know, I wonder sometimes in our society today if we aren't living in some ways in a thankless society that just kind of thinks and expects things to happen. When something good happens, that's the way it's supposed to. Wait a minute now. We need to realize how grateful and how thankful we ought to be as God's people. Thirdly, as we think today about pure religion, as found in James chapter 1, pure religion, real Christianity, promotes more hearing and less speaking. Notice the words of James 1, verse number 19. People who have not even read much of the Bible are familiar usually with this verse. Look in James chapter 1, verse number 19. James says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When I think about what can we do to help ourselves? What is real Christianity? Real Christianity means that we do more listening and less speaking. That is, when Je think about these words. To the seven churches in Asia Minor, Jesus would say in every one of the addresses, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Smyrna, to Ephesus, He would say, to him that has ears to hear, let him hear. What's the point of Jesus' words there? God gave you ears for a reason. We need to listen very carefully. Friend, I don't need to be always the one speaking. I don't have to always be... I need to listen to God and look to His Word and His will and when we're ready to hear and careful to listen. Friend, that's when our heart and mind is in tune with the will of God. Have you ever known someone who just had the gift of gab and no matter what subject came up and no matter how much or how little experience they had on that they always had the right answer the book of proverbs will say the fool he kind of runs off at the mouth as it were well christians need to do more listening it's no little thing it's no coincidence that god gave us two ears and one mouth we did twice as much listening and half as much speaking friend wouldn't we all probably be better off, and especially when we listen to and tune our heart and our life to the will of God. That's what real Christianity, 
pure religion is all about. Now, let's talk about that last one that's mentioned in James chapter 1 as it relates to pure religion. James chapter 1, verse number 27 will tell us pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You know, when I think about the rubber meeting the road, brass tacks, what Christianity is really all about, friend, a lot of what it comes down to is, are we really living our faith? James says pure, undefiled, in its purest sense, Real Christianity, what's it about? Visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction. Keep oneself unspotted from the world. You know, when we think about what it means to be a Christian, we've got to be able to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. The golden rule, Matthew 7, verse 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's what real Christianity is. You want to you see a real Christian? You want to see somebody who's got pure religion? See somebody who's out helping those who are in need. To visit. The word visit. Now sometimes if we're not careful, the word visit, uh, if we're not careful, it can mean, we can leave the impression that visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction, it, meaning that we need to get in our car, go to our house, sit down with them, and say, hi, how are you doing today, and just have a good conversation. But that's really not the gist of the original word. The original word there for visit means to take care of, to meet the needs of the widows and the orphans. If there's some good Christian lady in the congregation who has lost her husband, who is by herself, friend, as Christians, we want to do what we can to encourage, to help them, whatever their need may be, whether it be financial, whether it be physical, whether it be spiritual, whatever that emotional, whatever that need may be. We want to take care of them. We want to treat them as it were our own family in so many ways. And then, of course, the orphans, those who have lost father or mother, those who are widows indeed and true orphans who have nobody to take care of them. Friend, every Christian, ought to feel a sense of responsibility and a sense of urgency to want to help and take care of those people. Let's then turn our attention to James chapter 2, and we're just going to, for a few minutes, kind of highlight some of the other ideas in the book of James, and then next time we'll study James chapter 2 in depth, depth, but let's highlight some of these ideas in the next few chapters. In James chapter 2, James is now going to discuss an act of faith. And James will clearly teach us that true faith is always combined with works. I want you to look at James chapter 2, and I want you to notice these words with me. In James chapter 2, beginning in verse number 24, James says, You see then that a man is justified by works, hear this now, and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith, if it does not have works, without works is dead also. James says, I want to tell you about faith. There's a lot of ideas about faith. Some, some will say, I'm a faith Christian, and they mean by that, I've got a not, lot of knowledge. And then you've got other Christians who will say, no, 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 that's not the way it is. What's real faith? Listen to these words. James says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith alone was never God's intention. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, you take a body and that spirit that God placed in it, when it leaves that body, it's just us. It's just bones and flesh. That person, has that spirit has returned to God, the Bible teaches. That same way, someone who all they've got is knowledge and intellect and never does anything with their Christianity, well, their faith is just as dead as a body in a casket. What's the idea? Friend, we've got to realize, as James teaches us, the type of faith, 
that's going to please God is a faith that is out and active and doing God's will. Now, friend, please don't misunderstand what we're saying. We're saying we're going to earn ourselves. That's not the idea. And you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which is my duty to do. Luke chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. But in the same vein, let's realize Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. And so if my Christianity is going to be real, I've got to have an active working faith. Let's do this. Let's each stop for a minute and let's think about our life as a Christian. And let's ask ourselves, what am I doing for the Lord and His church? Not to my glory, but what am I doing for the cause of Christ? What am I doing for the Lord? And what am I doing for His church? And friend, if we can't find anything that we're doing, then we need to reevaluate our Christianity. Am I active? And am I working diligently in the kingdom of God? Then in James chapter 3, James is going to mention that real Christianity, the pure essence of Christianity, is about controlling the tongue. Notice James chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. James will say, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. And James will go on in that chapter to discuss the tongue. And he'll show us the problems that exist with it, but as much as anything, James will teach us that no man by himself can tame the tongue. Does that mean then that the tongue can't be tamed and we ought to just let it do and say whatever? No. No man is the idea. With God's help, can we learn to speak and to talk and to say the things God wants us to say? Absolutely. You know, sometimes we, we hear the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Nothing could be more false than a statement like that. The Bible teaches by our words will be justified and by our words will be condemned. Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37. The book of Proverbs teaches us that words have the power of life and of death. And so a real Christian, someone who's every day trying to live for the Lord. Are we saying that he's perfect and he never messes up and says anything he shouldn't? No, it's not what we're saying. But he's definitely working on the tongue. He's trying to tame it. He's trying to control it. And he's trying to use the tongue ultimately to the glory and honor of Almighty God. Then in the fourth chapter of the book of James, James is going to talk to us about how real Christianity is opposed to worldliness. You know, part of being a Christian is we realize we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Some of the strongest language in the Bible is found in James 4 verse 4. I want you to look at this verse with me. Look in James chapter 4 and notice what James says in verse number 4. James says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Friend, when we think about what's real Christianity all about, James says, and think about the strength of this language. When he says adulterers and adulteresses, it's as though I'm ready next to hear about some heinous sexual sin. That's not what he says. Do you not know friendship with the world is division with God? Whoever, therefore, makes himself a friend of the world has become God's enemy. Friend, we live in the world. We, God has created things for us to enjoy in this world, but it cannot be where our roots are at. Listen again to Colossians 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Do not set your mind on things below or things of the earth, Paul would say, for you've died. And your life is hidden with God in Christ. We need this. This world is going to do everything to try to trap us, 
to try to get its claws in us, to try to really get us to make it our most important uh, attachment and priority. And friend, that's a struggle for every person. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is found in Mark chapter 10. The rich young ruler, he came to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, keep the commandments. All these I've done from my childhood. One thing you lack. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. The Bible tells us that man went away sorrowful. Why? He had great possessions. Don't get so focused on the things and the stuff and the pleasures of this world that we lose out on what's really, really important. And then in chapter 5, James is going to show us that true religion is about having patience. James will say, consider Job. That great man, consider the patience or the perseverance of Job. He had trial after difficulty after problem that kept arising. And you know what Job said in the midst of that? Oh, listen to these powerful words. James, why do you want me to think about Job? Here's what Job said. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job 13, verse 15. Job never gave up on God. He never got so attached to the things of this world that it caused him to completely lose his focus. And friend, that's really such a powerful lesson for each one of us. And so, again, we hope that you'll continue with us as we're going to be studying in the book of James, as we think about real faith, faith that is in, has works and that is active, we hope that each one of us will be encouraged to live out our Christianity every day. If you're not a child of God, friend, as always, we want you to know God loves you. We love you as well. Won't you obey the gospel? Have you heard the message of Jesus? Romans 10, verse 17. Do you believe He's the Savior of the world? John 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin in repentance? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And would you, to have every sin washed away, be immersed in water? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Join us next time as we study more about faith in action. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.